Well, let's get to the reason we're all here tonight, David Bland. I'm really excited to have him back for the second time. As I mentioned, he was our first speaker when we first went virtual. He's the CEO and founder of Precoil. He's a co-author of this awesome book, Testing Business Ideas. Before that, he was a principal advisor at NEO, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Before that, he worked at AOL and Comscore. His Twitter handle is at David J. Bland. And I'm excited to hear his advice that he has for us tonight on how to escape the product death cycle. I thought this was great. Um, one question I had to start off with was, so we know product death cycle is pretty common. I would think it's pretty common. A lot of people are in that boat. And I'm just wondering, what does it take for a team to kind of realize they're in it? Because it, obviously the thinking, their, their kind of thinking got them there. It's like a little, it feels like a little bit like the boiled frog. So what is eventually kind of is the tipping point or something that makes someone, a team go, hey, wait a minute. I think we're in this, in your experience, what makes them aware, self-aware of that? Yeah, it's just this whole model of like, do they have the problem? Are they aware? And then are they actively seeking a solution? Yes. <laughs> yes. Do, and so to make them problem aware, right? And sometimes it takes an outside coach or somebody else that's detached from it to give them perspective and say, you all are keep adding more products to this, but we don't, we're not moving the needle in any meaningful way. You know? Yeah. So I've worked with teams that, you know, they kept adding features and adding features and adding features to the product. And uh, they just churned out customers faster. Like we looked at the the data and mix panel and right. you know, the more features they added, the faster people churned out. You know? right. So I do think if you're in a situation where it, it does need to be instrumented with analytics, which I think we're in a crowd here where a lot of people are more versed in analytics now, but right. you can't just measure progress on features or does it look better? You know, it's gotta be something of, are, are we moving the needle in some meaningful way? And so I think sometimes we, we make this mistake of, well, we asked them what they wanted and we built that thing and therefore it's better. But then if it didn't drive any metrics, you know, did it really make it better? And sometimes we make it worse. Right. So, right. um, yeah, sometimes it takes just some awareness. Like I'm a coach, so I, I'm usually the one pointing this stuff out, but I think for you all, especially if you're inside of a company, being able to kind of just recognize and say, wait, are, are we kind of in this cycle? Because like, I just heard an interview where the customer said we should build X, Y, and Z and we build it. And then they just still didn't use it. <laughs> so right. I, I think just like that cycle, just being aware of it, uh, how do you build awareness of it is really key. Cool. Yeah. I mean, one thing, one metric, you know, cause I've seen a lot of team is just kind of like they launch V1 of something and it doesn't do as well as they wanted. And so they add features like you're saying in the death cycle, right? Well, I wonder if one metric would just be like, how long has it been? Since, you know, like we've been telling ourselves this for months or nine months or 12 months and nothing's changed, right? Like just how long have we been since launch, you know, without any major change or improvement in the metric? Maybe that's a, an overall metric that indicates there's an issue maybe. Uh, yeah. And I like things like, um, you know, Sean Ellis test and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. where you ask like, how disappointed would you be if this went away? And if no one's right. disappointed, then you, you don't have product market fit yet. And so if you put something right. out there too early people have used it, but they don't see like, sometimes your value proposition was strong, but then the way you built the product, customers can't experience or unlock that value proposition. And right. so it, it, it's really confusing to teams who are like, well, everyone said they love this and they understood value prop, but then they don't use it or they won't pay enough for it. And so sometimes you have to kind of unwind that and say, why are people churning out? You know, like, why aren't they unlocking the value prop? And, and experiencing that value, like what, is there something we've done or maybe they can't find it or did we miss, do we disconnect things somehow? And um, so there's a lot of like, when you launch that V1 too early, it's a lot of, like I said, reverse engineering. I don't understand why people aren't using it. Let's try to figure out why they're not using it. And then far too often that leads into the, let's just add more features to it and then they'll use it. And quite often that could be like the opposite effect. So right. um, I, th I think it keeps coming back to like, you just need to defer building as long as possible. Um, it doesn't mean you can't build anything, but just don't build V1 until you really do have some solid evidence that your directional evidence that you can use to inform that build. But David, we've hired these engineers. What are they going to do? Yep. I know. That's why I get, I, I see teams that have 20 engineers on something. That's just an idea. And I'm like, well, yeah. you're going to build because that you have 20 engineers and you're going to build. Right. And so that right. is problematic sometimes where we over, over resource early stage stuff. Yeah. And I asked that half jokingly because it's like, if you buy into this, like, Hey, we need to do some discovery before we do building. There is a legitimate question. Well, what should our, we're paying these engineers all the, well, how should they spend their time? You know? 
Well, one way is they can assist in discovery. And I know that sounds uncomfortable, but they can assist in very specific ways. So for example, uh, engineers take really great notes. And so if you're doing customer discovery interviews, pair them with, you know, your researcher or your product person or your or whoever's doing those interviews that's conducting them and have them be there to take notes. And they don't have to lead the interview. They can just participate and still get the why behind the what they're going to build or potentially later. Yeah. But they can make that connection and they don't have all the pressure of leading an interview. They could also do things like if you're hacking together, like, you know, some kind of a clickable prototype or MVP or something, you know, like, but it's not a deep tech, you know, let's build something that's going to be completely robust and scalable kind of activity. It's going to be more, you know, exploratory. And, and so I think there's this notion that we can't involve them in that. But I think you can. You just have to be very specific on and how you do so. Yeah, and I think you started your talk off by mentioning no code, low code, you know, alternatives which have grown a lot recently. Um, is that another place? Or do engineers kind of like, oh no, I don't want to do that. That's beneath me because I'm not doing real coding. Or do you think you can employ them there? You, you can. Some. Uh, it, well, a couple things that play in there. One, um, my bigger clients are still kind of um, hesitant on low code, no code because of privacy mm -hmm. concerns. And so, anytime mm -hmm. their data goes outside their firewall, right? It's it's like mm, I don't know. Um, but but yeah, uh, I, I think they're becoming um, more. I mean, it's not that it's not coding. It's just like you just have to know how to use the tools like Bubble and all these different platforms. And so, um, I have to say, like. When I was at Neo, I would have loved to have that that product set um, instead of like having to think of the tech stack we're going to choose and then try to code everything. Um, if I was to do that again, I would totally do a low code, no code shop because it just makes so much more sense. And the tools have matured in a way that you can get sometimes one to two years out of them before you have to like scrap them and, and rebuild, especially if you don't scale super fast. And so it's just amazing to me how that whole area has matured. Um, and, but yeah, you're going to get some that just want to play in code, but I think some will be more akin to saying, okay, yeah, I can use some other tool to do this. If it, if it helps us learn, you know, more about the real need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. And then I really like your distinction, the light versus strong evidence and giving specific examples of, you know, what people say, a customer interview. And I really like how you said, you know, like, you know, going from one customer interview or like one set of customer interviews to two or three there's only so much additional like de-risking that's going to do because you're kind of just doing more of the same methodology, I guess. Right. And it's not really moving into the strong evidence camp. So I'm curious what, what advice you have for people that they're, yeah, they, uh, they like this idea of like, how to move from light to strong. What advice do you have for them from going from their, maybe their traditional, just doing more light for how to actually, you know, jump over to strong. I, I think just becoming familiar with more methods. You don't have to be an expert in all of them, but I think just being come like, some of the methods I, I talked about today, just being more familiar with them. And um, I, had, I had a client in San Jose actually, where I, I literally just drew, drew, drew like a line on their whiteboard. And I said, okay, what have we done so far? And they're like, oh, we did interviews and surveys. Okay. And I put, okay, I put light and strong and I put interviews, surveys on stickiness. And I put way over here on strong would be like, build the whole thing. And I was like, see how big this gap is? Like, what do we do in the middle of this? Cause we don't mm. like, if we get it wrong and we do this build, it's really hard to course correct from it. And they were kind of just scratching their heads They're like, oh, well, have we talked about like doing some paper prototyping or clickable prototypes? Or can we spin up like we create an explainer video and put it in front of people? Or could we do some kind of concierge or Wizard of Oz? And like they just weren't aware of it. And they thought, oh, we're going to do, you know, this big leap to building. And so the, mm. something as simple as visualizing it, like I just drew a line, yeah. um, help them understand the big gap between it's like, oh, well, what people say in a survey or write in a survey and tell me isn't necessarily what they're going to do if we build an app. And so how would we find, like, how would we become more confident about that before building the whole thing and then finding out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Well, you just mentioned clickable prototype. That's one of my favorite tools to use to validate products before we build. And it's an exciting time with like fig, the emergence of Figma and things like that. So I'm just curious, it, you know, what are you seeing as far as best practice with clickable prototypes um, from teams? Yeah, I mean, Figma is like really, really popular. Um, there's some other things I see where people use like pop app or something from Marvel where they mm -hmm. just take pictures of things and make them click mm -hmm. on the phone. And so then you could touch and it's still not high fidelity, but it's enough to get some early stage feedback. And so right. my um, what I'm trying to convey with them is like, if you put something really polished in front of a customer and it's really early stage, the kind of feedback you're going to get 
is going to be on usability. It's going to be, oh, I wish that was mm-hmm. green or I wish that button was over there. And, right. But then don't misinterpret their feedback on usability to mean they find it valuable and they might use the thing because quite often they're just giving you usability feedback. Sure. And if you ask them, oh, where in this life does this fit? Or have you experienced this problem in the past? And, and they're like, oh no, I wouldn't use it. <laughs> like, right. I don't, I don't totally. find it valuable, but I'm going to give you yeah. a lot of usability feedback. Totally. And so I think sometimes we, we misinterpret, like we kind of hear what we want to hear. And so we right. hear that, oh, they said the button should be over here. And so if we do that, they're going to use it. And it's like, no, no, they're, they're just telling you how like it should look, but it doesn't really translate right. into do they find it valuable. And so I think um, that's a common mistake I see with some early stage teams where they think all this usability feedback means that person's going to pay for it or they're going to value it. And quite often they, they don't. Yeah, I would just share a personal anecdote there firsthand. Same thing. Like I launched my beta product and we ran user tests, just like nonstop user tests for private beta. And we ran into usability issues and bugs and things like that. And, and then we, you know, we quickly iterated. So after like the 20th test, we had, and I call, I view it like the rough, rough edges. Like you're, you know, it's like polishing the rough edges off. Right. And then, so then I was like, okay, we're not hearing those issues anymore. Let me start asking people if they would use it. And even though in none of the tests that we never ran into any major usability issues, could we fix them to my surprise about 15, 20% of people would be like, the test would be going great from my perspective. And the very end, they'd be like, no, I would never use this. And I'm like, what? Like, but you didn't complain. You never proactively complained about anything. Like, what do you mean? They're like, well, I just, I don't like to get my news this way. It was a news product. I just don't like to get my news this way. It's almost like this mental model of philosophical dissonance. It didn't matter. And so we had, that, that solidified in my mind, the difference between usability feedback and product market fit feedback. Usability feedback can get in the way. If you have a bad usability you're not going to have product market fit because it gets in the way. But once, just because you get rid of all the usability, it just doesn't mean you have product market fit. So I, I learned that the hard way. And, and that's why what you said also makes me think of one of my other favorite tools, Balsamic, which is a low fidelity prototyping tool. Because to your point, people help, can't help but engage with that visual layer, the colors, the fonts. And so when you do like a grayscale Balsamic, they can't tell you, oh, changes to green or purple. Or like I don't like it, right? So um, yeah, that's a good point that if it's too polished, you get a different kind of feedback. All right, cool. And I love the the categorization of all the experiments. I'm curious, given your experiment, your experience, and you're familiar with all these, are there some that are particularly good that you're like the like hidden gems that are underutilized that people you wish people more people or teams knew more were more familiar with because they're so good? I would say um, letter of intent because it's a one page mm-hmm. non legally binding document that closes the say do gap, and so a lot mm-hmm. of my B two B clients. You know, they go from, well, if we're in front of the customer, they're going to expect us to sell them something. And then, and all, and I was like, or they say they're going to buy a bunch of oh, whatever, this piece of hardware, they're going to buy like 40 of them. Like one of the case studies I have in the book is um, it's a connected sprinkler startup, right? And they would go to landscapers and they would say, oh, I want to buy 40 of these. And they're like, oh, great. Um, can we get that in writing just as a one pager? So we understand, you know, our inventory demand and all that. And they would write 20. They're like, wait, you just said 40, but you wrote 20. And they're like, well, let's start with 20. And it's like, okay, that 40 number wasn't real, but mm. we are going to do 20 maybe because they put it in writing. And so at least, at least it's like closer to reality. Mm-hmm. And so um, sometimes we go from like what they say to, then we do this giant contract or RFP and all this other stuff. And I'm like, can we close that gap a little bit in the meantime? And can we just do an LOI? And like some of my B2B, because I, I advise a lot of B2B companies, We'll use those on the front stage with kind of like customers, but we might also use them on the backstage, you know, for partners to say, oh, we need a partnership to do this or distribute in a way. And we'll use LOIs on the backstage too. Now you have to check in with legal, you know, obviously to do that. But, <laughs> um, I don't think enough people even know about it. So they, they, they just go from what they say to, to this do, and they're just assuming, but you can do something in the middle. Um, and you can be creative. Like some of the stuff we go into hospitals with, and nurses will be like, I love this. And it's like, oh, can you write a letter of recommendation to your hospital oh. administrator? And they'll say, well, no, I'm not going to write that. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah. you love it, but you're not going to expend any social capital yes. on yes. it in writing. Yes. And then others yes. will go, yeah, I'm happy to write that letter of recommendation. Yeah. And so like little things like mm-hmm. that can, can help kind of close that gap a bit. And I just don't feel like they're utilized enough. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. the saying, you know, there's like the attitudinal data, what they say versus what they do, behavioral data. That reminds me of something another speaker at our meetup said, which is what's the skin in the game for your experiment? What's the skin in the game? 
And so he would basically be like, there's your time, there's money, and there's like social reputation. It's like, oh, David, it sounds like you really like this prototype. You know, um, we're going to have a new version in three weeks. Can we book time on your calendar right now? Right. And if you're just if you're giving me the false positive, yes, then you're going to be like, well, let me talk to my admin and see what I don't know. You have to get back to me. On it. But if you're really into it, then they kind of you're going to book it. Right. Or like, oh, David, it sounds like you really liked it. Can you recommend three other consultants that we could show this to that would also like, it? you know, it says it's a way to call BS on those false positives. I thought it was pretty good. And then the last one, yeah, even an LOI that's getting in the game, right? So um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, when we designed, I did with them one client, we were doing like an app, a B2C app on the app store. And I was like, well, let's do skin in the game, like $3 for the app. I didn't think that was that much. And the founders thought it was too much. And so what we did instead was, you have to agree to be in the private beta. You have to agree to give five hours of feedback. Like play around with the product for five hours and give us feedback. And I was like, I don't know if that's enough skin in the game, but sure enough, we did the interviews and people, these interviews would be going great. And then it got to the end. It's like, sounds like you're really excited, David. Well, we have a private beta. The only command we're asking for is five hours. Like, Oh no, no, no. You know, it's just funny. It's just it's hilarious. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And then also with pricing, um, something yeah. I think is people stress out about viability is price testing. And so even like when we transitioned all the workshops from in person to online and like masterclass, there was a big question, like would people even pay for online workshops? Um, price tested three different options, right? And the people that paid the uh, highest option, we, we actually decided to go with the second highest option. And so just yeah. refunded the people, the difference for the people that paid a higher option. And so it's not like you can't test pricing in a way mm. where like, you can just refund the people, the difference too. And so there's just all these things where I just feel as if um, there's a lot of anxiety and kind of, you know, uh, stuff that comes with this test, like the testing that keeps us, pulled us back and say, oh, we can't do that. And it's usually because we're, we're just embarrassed or anxious or, you know, stressed out about the test. And in reality, it's kind of like, well, no, there are ways to address a lot of that. <laughs> so let's just be right. careful how we design it. But yeah. Well, that brings up what I hear a lot of times people, you know, in my workshops or something or the, hear the lean stuff. Yeah, this all lean stuff sounds great. I mean, it sounds great, but, but Dan and David, we have a brand to protect, you know, we can't just go put some MVP out there because we're big brand X. So I'm sure you've probably heard this too. So I'm wondering how, what, what, how do you, uh, what do you give advice for people that want to apply these principles of getting tripped up on this? Like, Oh my gosh, we can't put something out there. that's going to embarrass the brand or look bad. Yeah. I see people's like um, opinions on this evolving. So at first, when I ran into that, we would do like a labs brand or a sub brand or something mm -hmm. like that, that would be a, a parent, you know, so it'd be, you know, you could trace it back to the parent company if you looked in like terms of service and all that. Right. But, um, you know, so a lot of the new Adobe products that are out there were tested off brand, you know, a lot of the ones I advised on, like even Adobe express, if you like look back through like the whole winding journey of Adobe express and XD and some of those, there were, there were a lot of off brand project brands as well. Adobe does it. Um, now if you look at some of the newer stuff though, I'm noticing like, um, Indiegogo has become almost like this hotbed for product testing for big companies, not so much Kickstarter, but Indiegogo. And so on Indiegogo, you'll see like labs brands. So you'll see like first build, which is really, you know, GE appliances. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see first wave, which is really Delta, uh, Delta faucets. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I see some other companies like Philips, like they didn't even bother creating a sub brand. They just threw out their new like projector on there as in. Right. And I was like, these big companies, it's not like you need the money, right. To create the new thing. What they're trying to do is test desirability and viability. Does anybody care Would they pay for it or fund it at all before we spend a bunch of time and effort and energy right. and money to build the thing. And so I've been really watching this like Indiegogo. I have like this laundry list of Indiegogos that I keep a track of. And um, I see like 3M on there. I see Unilever. Mm. I see like, um, like these companies, like Bose is on there. I, I see these companies like testing out. And I know they're just testing. Should we invest in this at all? Right. And, sure. and, but it's, but it's like really uncomfortable them to do because it's out there in the world, you know, it's right. not necessarily right. like brand and all that. And so a couple of ways they do it is labs brand. Or uh, they just put their brand on it with a caveat of like, this is an early stage thing and we want to co-create mm -hmm. with people. And so um, not every company comes along for the ride on that journey, but right. there are ways to address it, um, you know, especially with the labs and, and like sub branding that, you know, I mean, look at HP, right? Like Omen, 
their brand actually worked against them because like no gamer is going to want to buy an HP. Cause they're like my grandfather used an AP, HP mm -hmm. and I can't use that for gaming. And so they, they launched this Omen sub brand and, and like they are doing wildly successful with a brand that's tailored to like millennials that want to game because right. their brand actually worked against them there. So like right. leading with HP brand would have kind of backfired. And so the branding is just an interesting conversation. And right. I get that you don't want to destroy it and do all that, but I do think it's, it's a conversation stopper when they say we can't do that here. And it's like, sure. well, why? And then you start digging in and you realize actually you can. <laughs> so can we get, you know, right. you know, some compromise going on, but yeah. Yeah. And I want to pick up on something you cover quickly. Like for me, I'm like, just pick up some fake name. Like don't you just, just pick some random name. Like don't, don't have any association with the brand. You just want to test this concept, right? Like just pick some random name. Right, like, yeah, with Adobe, we spent probably like 30 minutes picking up a name. We just put a bunch of white on the whiteboard, right? And then we just picked one. Yeah. And so, uh, for yeah. that one, we chose Spruce, and then it became Spark, and then it became part yeah. of Voice, and then it became like right. part of Adobe Express eventually. And right. and so, the, the brand like didn't matter that much, it, right. it was more about does right. it solve a need, and exactly? Does it really solve a need? Because your brand can work against you, like, if you throw that Adobe logo sure. on something, it's really new, and you're going to have thousands of people check it out just because it's Adobe. And it's like, right. We need all that noise. We just want to know is this is a real problem we're trying to yeah. solve. And so right. it can actually work against you in, in some ways. Yeah. So by doing an anonymous brand, basically you can do all this MVP testing without anybody knowing where it's actually from. Like that's the bottom line is it's just like, so we're some startup. You can just act like you're some random startup doing it. Right. So, cool. All right, let's switch to audience questions now. Thanks so much, David. I think the first question is from Sajad. Thank you. Um, hi, David. Uh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Um, quick question about setting targets when it comes to experiments. Um, so let's say we set, uh, so I'm with the successful B2B company, tens of thousands of customers um, and uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of users as well we run an experiment we have a hard time sort of setting okay what what should be uh the target that we that we set there in terms of usage so we put a fake door there or we do a single feature mvp for example um how we how should we be thinking about that it's probably the hardest thing uh next to just like having a well-formed hypothesis um I noticed that uh, the acceptance criteria, success fail criteria is r really hard for some teams. Now, in some cases you can go external and find that data. Like um, I use an unbounced report for almost all my call to action testing on landing pages because they publish a report and it um, shows you what industry, what's the average, you know, call to action, you know, conversion uh, per industry and all that. And I can say, oh, well, this is the industry average. So we're going to be like using that as a target. Or you could go to Facebook ads and say, what's like the, you know, like what's the average click through rate on some kind of thing. But so many of these you can't. And so especially with my really, really complex B2B customers, there is no place, magical place out, outside that you go and find the data and say, oh, that's, that's the number we're going to hit. And so in those situations, usually what I do is I say, okay, uh, like a lot of my work is tied to like metered funding and internal like um, VC funding kind of stuff. And so what we would do is like the team has funding for let's say 12 weeks and they have to come back and present, you know, what are the risks they, they had? Uh, what are the experiments they ran? What's the evidence they generated? And then we basically make a pivot, persevere, kill decision in, in that session, right? And so those stakeholders have an idea in their head, like what they would need to see to invest more in that opportunity. Right. And so what I normally recommend is like, okay, let's talk to them before this meeting and say, like, what are we looking at here for? What does this need to be attractive to our company? You know, directionally, what do we need to see? And it's not perfect, but it's at least a conversation to say, you know, you don't want to go into that session and say, uh, one out of 20 customers, wanted this. So we're going to persevere. And, and they wanted, you know, 10 out of 20. <laughs> and so, you know, you look at some companies like in the masterclass, that Alex and I run, um, we talk about Bosch and Bosch ran like two, over 200 different companies through this program. Um, and when they made pivot, persevere, kill decisions, the committee uh, always was aligned with the team. And so they had managed expectations as such that they didn't have a lot of friction where the team would say, um, this was not worth investing in. And then the stakeholders would go, yes, you should. Like it didn't happen because they actually talked to each other, you know? And so I would say when you look at acceptance criteria, at least have a conversation with people that are on the hook for help funding this thing 
of what does make this attractive? Like what kind of directional evidence should we see? And that helps you calibrate a bit. It's not about like the exact number getting it wrong or right. It's more about directionally, are you aligned with the people funding this work? And so that you don't come into a session saying, I think this is amazing. And they're like, that number is terrible. Uh, we should kill this right now. That's what causes the friction. It's not, you know, oh, we should have been at 10% conversion. We're at 9.5. So we should kill it. Like in reality, that never happens <laughs> in any team I'm on. You know, it doesn't mean you give up your 0.5% off your conversion, but it's where the real gaps and misalignment occurs that that's where it causes problems. So having that conversation with your stakeholders uh, beforehand sh should help with the stuff that you can't go outside and find, you know, uh, baseline numbers to, to compare against. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your question. And then next up we have Ritesh. Yeah. The question, I think it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's even like a little bit personal, but I'm going to ask it, um, and hope like uh, hope to see what your thoughts are. Um, so if you're working on a startup idea and you've done customer interviews, right, you're at a um, like click clickable prototype stage, right? Um, when, what kind of evidence is good enough to tell you that you can leave your full-time day job and right, jump into right, this thing full-time? Uh, it's a B2B right, uh, startup idea. Right? Yeah, I, I don't think clickable prototype stage is enough <laughs> to make that decision. <laughs> I'll just call that out. Uh, usually it's it's paying customers, uh, even if it's uh, prepaying, right? Even if they're, um, you know, pre-ordering something or they pre-subscribed to something you're going to deliver, you know, usually you aim for about 10. Uh, I mean, most accelerators, incubators that are going to ask you, you know about getting into them they're going to ask you about your customers how much you know about them how much how many paying customers you have and so sure. usually uh from b2b point of view 10 is kind of the guideline it kind of depends on your pricing model and everything um but you don't want to make that switch usually without paying customers um just because you could potentially end up in a bad spot where the people that give you feedback on the clickable that's still desirability and so viability is your revenue and your cost and if they're not going to pay high enough price or you can't create this thing at a low enough cost, you still might be in a really bad spot. And so uh, I don't know if there's a perfect number, but usually with B2B, it's like, how many paying customers can I get? And then um, if it's a subscription, right, it's, well, can I get an annual subscription instead of a monthly? You know, can I get people to sign up for something like that? And there are all these different things, especially if it's SaaS based B2B, you can do. But just be really careful jumping too early. Um, that's one of the reasons we wrote the book is because I wrote it for like solopreneurs and corporate innovators and, um, you know, uh, kind of like people with side hustles, like solopreneurs, like, like, like basically entrepreneurs and solopreneurs. And so the people that have the side hustles, I was trying to give them some options to say, here's some more things you can do to get more confidence in whether or not you should make that switch because making it too early on just light evidence could be problematic. So I keep coming back to viability on that one. It's like having paying customers, even if you don't have the full product out yet, um, having them like literally give you payment information is going to be key before you can make some kind of determination. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. I, it's funny when clubhouse was, was like really, really like popping, I guess, uh, I, I just hang out on like the tech stars, uh, founder interviews, you know, and I would just listen to them grill B2B founders, on what it takes to get money, right? And time and time again, it was always, how many paying customers you have? <laughs> and that number didn't have to be huge. It could be like, oh, well, I have 10 paying a thousand a month. And like, sometimes that's enough to get funding, right? Uh, but it was always coming back to like the viability question. Nice, all right. Thanks for your question. Next up, we have Carol. Question, what uh, optimal experiments would you uh, suggest for running a B2B subscription, like pre-market fit idea? Oh, um, hmm. I mean, B2B, um, I actually have, I don't think if I have something I can share with you, or, or maybe I can just drop it in the board. Um, I do have like some sample sequences. Um, I was going to try to give you something more tangible here. Give me one second. I just need to pull up a board. Uh, basically, I, I try to separate them like B2B, B2C, highly regulated and, and all that. And so mm -hmm. um, what I'm going to do is... The fact here, that it's 
And the fact that it's a freemium subscription, does that uh, even more tailor that towards specific experiments? Um, I mean, freemium is always a tough play. Um, but basically what I'm going to do is let me copy this. So in the board, I know we're not sharing the board right now. I'll put this like down below where we did our stickies or down below concierge. I'm going to put this down below concierge. So if you're paying attention to the board, uh, let me get all move mode here. Okay. So I just dropped in sequences for you. Okay. And I'll make Thanks. this bigger. So with B2B, uh, there we go. Let's put it right there. Um, so what are the sample B2B? So I have in here, I have um, sample B2B uh, software, hardware services. So for services, right? Uh, mm -hmm. One of the flows I had was um, you could do some kind of like, I don't know where you're at in your journey, but we could do some interviews to understand some more like stakeholder unmet needs. We could do if we have customer support analysis, we could go digging through that. Um, usually we would test these with like a brochure, either physical or digital. And then potentially you could go for some kind of like pre-sale with from that and then go into like a concierge where you're um, uh, manually delivering it at small scale anyway. And so that's one uh, path, but it's not like a right or wrong. It's just more of like what experiments help you kind of bring in that next best test to get you a little more evidence that you're on the right track. And so, um, yeah, so I, I just posted them in there for you if you want some reference points, but you don't have to follow them exactly. It's just kind of a, a, a guideline. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Great, Carol. Thanks for your question. Next up, we have Sean Murphy. Good to see you again. Hey, I had a couple of suggestions for methods to consider. Okay. Uh, the first is, um, so cognitive task modeling, you might look up the critical decision method or shadow box, or it comes out of the naturalistic decision modeling. It looks at how people actually make decisions and for at least B2B, where you're selling to experts, that's part of it. Um, the other one you might look at is process data mining, which is a, which is a technique for collecting actual evidence of what the current practice looks like. Okay. So no, it's an alternative to shadowing people. Have you done anything with using kind of Bayesian updating? Cause you're talking a lot about evidence, but I didn't understand how you actually combine different evidence or updated your confidence as you gather new evidence. What's your process for actually taking this evidence and combining it? Uh, I don't use like Bayesian or anything. So, I mean, I guess I come back to the social sciences aspect of this. Um, so basically um, we use scorecards and I don't, I don't have one I can share with you now, but, uh, with, with sliders in the sense of we're trying to go from light to strong and then we have, um, some scoring on that. And so the way we kind of look at it from a scorecard perspective, you kind of have strategic fit and, uh, stuff about like the, um, how adaptable it is, but then we go through desirability, viability, feasibility, and go through, um, kind of each element of something like, um, like a business model canvas. And then, um, we have certain thresholds for like to promote out of, let's say, um, a sprint you have, like, you can't test all this at once. So we try to aim in on desirability first and then a little bit of viability and then more viability and then feasibility. And so I wouldn't say there's a specific, like, there's probably more work to be done here, but we're not using like quantitative as much as you're, you're, you're doing what's called elimination by aspect. So you're focused on, do we have desirability? If not, then you knock out. Otherwise, then you do go, I would assume, to feasibility and then profitability. Yeah. So we're trying to get make the case of, do you have your value prop right with uh, a fit with unmet needs? And then are the willingness to pay? Can we do low enough, low enough costs? And then backstage more about, can you do this and can you scale it? So we've kind of broken it all out. But I, I don't say the times I've tried to over quantify it. And maybe, maybe you're better at this than I am, but every time I tried to over quantify, I felt like it gave a level of precision that didn't accurately represent what was going on. So for example, I would have teams that would say, we've reduced risk by like 4.35%. But in reality, like how you, how you get to that number, I felt was the math was really fuzzy and I wasn't comfortable with it. But I mean, I'm sure there are ways to address it, but I've kind of backed off that approach a bit just because because I felt like the precision gave a false security of the amount of risk they reduced. But overall, um, yeah, I just have 44 different methods, but I mean, there's plenty more than that out there um, that, that people can leverage for sure. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah Sean, and I, I understand your question. And uh, actually one of our other speakers, Alberto Savoya, is really big on evidence. He wrote the book, The Right It. 
Yeah, and yeah. no, he's more the, numeric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm did familiar with his, his stuff. Yeah, did you see I'm his familiar with his work. Yeah, he really he seem, basically got could, into like card counting, blackjack card counting equivalent. <laughs> um, so he's where, doing like, Bayesian updating. Work. He's yeah, doing yeah, yeah. Bayesian updating. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. yeah, I reached out to him. So I, I used his um, pretend to own story in testing business ideas. So I referenced him, but I think awesome. those books like complement each other really well because I'm more like, how do you map risk and get to themes and then design and then refine to a, a hypothesis and then design experiment yeah. that matches the risk. And he's much more coming at it from like the quantitative calculation angle. So I think there's like plenty of room for more books to be written on this subject too. Uh, I feel like those are the two that people usually that, uh, that I hear recommended a bunch though, but yeah, he's got yeah. great stuff. I'm a, I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> And the talk that he gave is, be, I think, is even beyond the number. This is post book kind of quantitative, quantitative approaches to it, which is cool. But yeah, great, awesome, okay. Uh, depends how much you want to geek out on this stuff. It's all good. All right, <laughs> different levels for everybody. All right, next question is from McKenna. Welcome. Cool. Um, so we've talked a lot about completely new products as well as new bets. I was just wondering, how does your approach change for someone that's working on? a single product within a larger organization. Does that change if you're working on, uh, yeah. It changes a little bit. Um, and again, I'm mostly playing in the idea unmet needs to product market fit space. Once you have product market fit and you're trying to keep it, um, or grow it, I would say, um, it's usually the way you apply the stuff is you look at features and you look at things you might add. And then instead of just asking people what they want and go, building that right you you can get to the unmet needs behind the features so it's a lot of like those preference and prioritization experiments where you're trying to understand um the unmet needs and the priority priorities of their the unmet needs and then uh the jobs to be done and then your strategy of the company where they overlap and all that so it, it's just more like at a tactical level um unless you're really trying to like take what you've learned with that product and recreate it in a different way to drive more revenue, um, like something a little further away from the core. But for the most part, if you have an existing product, it's just like thinking about the assumptions you're making in your backlog and the assumptions you're making in your roadmap. And so I still use that desirable, viable, feasible framing as like an input into that conversation. So for example, let's say you had like something really risky on your roadmap for your B2B product. What I would do is I would like, let's write down the desirable, viable, feasible assumptions about that and let's map them out. And then which are ones that like have to be true where we have the least amount of evidence. And then, so when we build out our strategy and our plan, can we have like a learning plan? Like some of my clients called a learning plan or an experiment plan to, um, to go after those things that were really risky versus, um, building it and launching it and then finding out, you know, if those are right. And so it's just like different inputs to that two by two. Um, I didn't, I didn't reference it here. It's in, um, if you look at Google Sprint uh, Kit, uh, Google asked me to include that two by two in their program. So uh, it, it's just called assumptions mapping. It's just like a two by two. There are plenty of different versions of it. Like Laura Klein has one and Jeff and Josh, uh, who I used to work with at Neo have one. And there's a bunch of different versions of it. But the version I do is like pulling in desirable, viable, feasible themes. And so usually that's the key. So whether you're looking at your roadmap or your backlog, you know, mapping that out and then matching an experiment to that risk. And so the experiments just tend to be more like a tactical level because there's something very specific in your roadmap or your backlog that, that um, you're trying to suss out. So, yeah, so I, I would, that's how I would approach it. Not necessarily from like um, creating a brand new product, but from a, here's what we're trying to do. What are the risks in it? Can we map them out and design experiments to fit that risk and then fit that into your discovery delivery, hopefully model that you have going on inside your company. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your question, McKenna. Next up, we have John. David, awesome presentation. This has been super insightful. Really appreciate it. Uh, one question I had uh, is about customer charter programs uh, where customers will pay to be part of product development. Um, I've seen that as being a, a good way to get skin in the game, to get people more engaged, to make sure that uh, a product is built that they uh, will use. So how do uh, customer charter programs play into your discovery and validation experiments? And yeah, that would, okay. And part two is, is it, do you see this program being the same as the letter of intent that you mentioned? Um, 
Potentially. So if they're paying to be part of a program, it, it's more about the um, co-creation aspect of it. Right. And so in discovery, um, usually those activities kind of play out as like, are you doing product box or storyboarding together or you're uh, like co-creating in some way? I actually like that. Um, I feel that's more like testing with people instead of testing on people. Right. And so when you have them invited in, they're willing to pay to be a part of the creation process. I think that's amazing. And so I would put that in more of like the discovery side of things. Um, where to be careful with that is that I've advised companies where they sort of over relied on that or they over relied on the feedback from early adopters. And then they locally optimize their entire product for a very small set of customers. And then it flopped when it went into mass market mm -hmm. because if I, it, what happened was like the people that kept telling me it's amazing. They were like the only people that thought it was yeah. amazing. <laughs> is that, is that, so that's one of the challenges with it. So just, like you have to go beyond them at some point. Right. So is that a matter of not confusing the early adopters with the mass market? Yeah. I, you know, I really love, um, Justin Wilcox's mashup with that. We did a conference in New Zealand together and um, uh, I'm still in touch with him. He's pretty amazing. He's in the Bay Area too. And he mashed up like Steve Blank's um, kind of have aware seeking model with um, the crossing the chasm. And the way it kind of plays out was like your early adopters usually have the problem and they're aware and they're actively seeking a solution and maybe they've even built their own. Those are really ideal to test with early on. And so you can co-create with them. They're willing to tolerate bugs and all that. But when you go further up that bell curve, you run into people that have the problem and they're, and they're aware, but they're not seeking. And then you run into people that have the problem and they're not aware and they're not seeking. And so your strategy is more about, well, why are these people not seeking? And then how do you generate awareness for folks? And so it just changes a lot of your strategy. Sure. And so that little like sketch he did with me, I still show it to everybody. Um, it helped me kind of understand that your early adopters, they're great to test with, but they're relatively small sample size. And I think someone put it else in chat about Indiegogo being early adopters and you're, and you're correct. Um, they're passionate, but if you like to think of that, have aware seeking, they should eventually, like, ideally they have all three. And then when you're moving up to mass or like early majority, late majority, there are going to be some folks that aren't seeking and aren't aware. And then how do you approach that from just a strategy point of view? So, um, I just say it from personal experience because the team I coach, like I just felt like they really had to shut down their company. It was a game studio. They had to shut it down because they just over optimized their video game for like a really, really small sample size of early adopters. Sure. Um, so that's the one thing you just, I don't know. It, it always comes back to like, Oh, don't make that mistake. <laughs> like they're great to co-create with, but don't, like, don't place too much emphasis on their feedback either. Yeah, that's fair. Thanks. Hi, yeah. John, thanks for your question. Okay, last questions of the night. I think he has two questions. Ari? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, hi, David. Um, I wanted to ask a couple questions more around your the light and strong piece of the evidence area, particularly in more in like research teams, incubation teams, focusing on that zero to one, how you would approach that differently. Um, I tend to think of this like from that no evidence area and going out to light and using like a little bit of the scorecard that you were mentioning, like differentiation, relevance, sustainability, IP around that. I was just wondering if you had any techniques or frameworks to help you kind of guide that process when you really might not have enough signal when you're really doing like trying to create a new category. Yeah, I think, um, and we didn't get into today, but like the sequencing, sometimes I, I frame that as like uncertainty, time and fidelity. And mm -hmm. so the way I frame it is like when your uncertainty is really high, you keep your fidelity and your costs low with your research. And so you're basically trying to get directional evidence to inform another thing that you can slowly build up the case that, you know, so at some point you cross the threshold and you go, this is worth investing in, you know? And yeah. so I don't know how your incubation, everything's set up, but you know, um, like if a team gets like 50 K, right. Uh, let's say they get 50 K in like 12 weeks, which is, it was quite a lot. I mean, it depends on your sector, but it's a lot of money. And so being able to kind of like, iterate through that process and build up like a series. So let's say you did um, uh, like an experiment a week for 12 weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have 12 experiments that are kind of building a direction on whether or not, you know, you should pivot, persevere, or kill something. And, and then, then, you pro then you proportionally give them more funding uh, if they can say, oh, we have some directional evidence. We just need to persevere, but we need funding for X, Y, and Z. And the, and the way I typically do that is like, uh, what kind of risk do we have? And then what's our plan to address that risk? And then how are we going to use that funding to address that risk? Um, and so, I mean, it's kind of a bigger conversation, but um, I, I tend to just like 
encourage teams to kind of go through that, that journey versus mm-hmm. um, like, I'm going to do a bunch of market research, but do it different ways and, and not necessarily close the gaps at all. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I think setting a time box and, 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 and um, coupling it to funding helps it helps teams understand that like they just can't go into that conversation with a couple of interviews and surveys and expect to get more funding. Uh, they, they have to show something that's more. And so what is that more? Is it like more skin in the game evidence basically around um, desirability, viability and feasibility. Mm-hmm. And so they can't do it all at once, but usually if you get your value prop wrong, it's going to be really hard to build something that's going to work. <laughs> so you're like yeah. frantically searching for about like a market for your value prop, you know? Um, so I, I don't know if that explains like what I'm, um, trying to answer I get the, specific yeah, I kind of get the drift of that. And then, um, I think my second question, I had something posted something about differently, but I wanted to kind of jump on a thread that you were talking a little bit about earlier, where it's like you're building a little bit too early. Right. And, and this kind of comes down to the resources that folks have, and maybe you have a lot of research people and they just want to build, build, build. And when you don't have the right people or they don't really kind of want to spend the time on focusing like the market research, the value proposition, are we building the right thing at the right time? Things like that. Like how do you kind of navigate that to make, to kind of get those folks that just want to build right away and not do the proper requirements and the proper research for value prop, things like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm usually brought in at a a leadership level in the sense of Mm -hmm. leadership's been talking about this with their company. Right. And and now they, they want to, they want to, they wanted to do something about it. like, there's one thing about the leadership giving lip service to working this way versus giving companies, like giving your people the tools to do it, you know? And so the reason, one of the reasons I'm usually brought in is like, uh, companies overweight feasibility and they lack on desirability, viability. And so, um, one of the things I come in is like, okay, can we assemble a team that at least can answer those three themes? Cause if you don't have a team that's balanced enough to answer those three, then yeah. they're going to, they're going to um, fall back to what they know and what they're incentivized to and what they're rewarded for doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my, my inside joke is like R and D it's usually a lot of R and no D or a no R and a lot of D is <laughs> like, I've never seen R and D where it's like a nice balance of R and D usually. Yeah. So it's kind of like how you configure it. And so I would just take a step back and say, you know, for a new initiative, do you have people, it, it doesn't even have to be their roles and titles, but do you have people that can represent those three themes like mm-hmm. desirability, value prop, unmet needs, um, mm-hmm. viability, cost and revenue, and being able to put the numbers behind that. And then feasibility, like being able to activities and resources and, and being able to execute. And so, um, some people call that the triad, which I think is yeah. Illuminati, yeah. like, uh, trio. or a trio, like the, the Teresa calls it a trio. Um, and so, uh, I, I think that's really key though, because if you skew towards one, um, it's kind of hard to say like where, like when you're trying to pay down your risk, it's hard to say where it is in relation to the other themes. And so Mm -hmm. like, if I'm just working with designers, I love designers, but they're going to prioritize all the desirability risk. And then we're going to miss out on viability, feasibility, if we don't have representation in the room that can answer that. And so I don't know where their desirability risk fits in with all the rest of the risk that we didn't talk about. And so I feel like those three themes are really, really important. And so I think having people like the way you configure, I I call them designing teams. Maybe it's a little uh, Mm -hmm. facetious of me, but I, I try to say like, can you design a team that can address all three of those, those themes? And so that's, that's how I try to approach it and then also have leadership support. So, you know, uh, I'm usually brought in like the C level or board level. So mm-hmm. it's, it's not a, it's not a problem getting people the resources to do the stuff. It's more of just, uh, I feel like the way the teams are configured are, are problematic. Yeah. Um, but I call them, you know, that squad pattern, right. And when that squad pattern is like really imbalanced where it's essentially all tech don't have the right designer, don't have the right product people it becomes really difficult to kind of say, all right, are we actually going down the right path here? Because if people, they got the one that's all tech, and I sit within the C2 office and, you know, I'm a researcher myself, but I still have that product type lens. Yeah, so uh, one of the ways we try to frame in the book is um, there's team design of like getting the right people together. And then there's team behavior which is how is the team behaving? And then there's a team environment. And so sometimes you have an awesome team and they're put in an environment where they can't succeed. And so a lot of my work with leaders is like, are you creating an environment where this kind of work can flourish? 
because you can take an awesome team and put them in an environment where they can't talk to customers or they can't use the brand or they can't use the IP or they can't launch anything. And, and they're going to fail because they're not in an environment conducive to working this way. And so um, I, I'm starting to break through with that, I think, because now I'm having conversation with leaders where it's like, oh, we're really bad at this. We want to get better. What do we have to do besides the teams? And I'm like, oh, well, you need to secure your funding. You need a pipeline of ideas. Uh, you need a process that's repeatable with the experiment library. Like I, I'm having more of those conversations now versus like, oh, it must just be the team. Quite often, it's, it's, it's not just the team. It's like the environment the teams reside in. And I think leaders are beginning to become aware of that. Cool. Thanks a lot. All right, Ari, great. Thank you for your question. Um, and thanks again, Dave. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us and great talk and all the great Q&A. It's awesome. Um, one thing, did you, so a couple of people said, I'd love to take your workshop. Do you, don't, do you not, do you have an upcoming workshop you want to tell people about? Yeah, I just posted in chat and it's also in this okay, board cool. in the top, in the bottom right. Ah, okay, cool. Um, but basically, yeah. So I've been doing cohorts with Maven. So Maven's kind of like uh, it's a newer platform. It's like Goggin, um, who, who I met actually at Lean Start Machine in in, um, in Silicon Valley, and then Wes Cow, who used to like uh, work with Seth Godin and uh, designing his experiences. And so I do this like shared ten day experience, um, and I ran two of those this year so far. So one this summer, and one just a couple weeks ago. I just wrapped up, and then uh, but I'm doing. I'm not going to do another one of those this year, but I'm doing a smaller workshop on December 6th. So I put the link in there. Uh, it's pretty small as far as like an investment perspective goes. It's not like a big lift as far as my other stuff I do. So uh, yeah, so basically you just bring your ideas and then we're going to work through them in the workshop together. So it's not going to be a lot of case studies. It's going to be like you put to work on your ideas, doing assumptions mapping and, and, and selecting experiments. So uh, yeah, check it out. I just launched it today, actually. So it was good timing uh, for the <laughs> for the talk. Um, and yeah, and then stay in, stay in loop. Like um, you can follow me on LinkedIn and I'll post business memes and you'll probably learn about other workshops I'm doing in Q1 publicly. So yeah, I'm around. Thanks again, David. Really appreciate it.